This presentation is entitled Dream Big, Tools for Supporting Individual Choice and a Robust Community-Based Life, a workshop for direct support professionals. It is brought to you by the New Hampshire Council on Developmental Disabilities, ABLE NH, and People First of New Hampshire as part of the Living Well NH Quality Frameworks Grant. Welcome again, everyone. My name is Lisa Bedwin. I am on the team of the three of us presenting today's workshop. I am the executive director of ABLE New Hampshire, the Granite State's only disability justice organization that is free of public funds. We don't provide any supports or services. We, we advocate, educate, and organize families to share their voices and individuals impacted by disability. Um, I am the mother of two sons. My oldest is a person who experiences trisomy 21. You refer to this as Down syndrome. And he is the reason why I pivoted my career. And he drives my passion for this work. I'm Kelly Ehert. I work at Marshalls in Nashua, the Institute on Disability and the let's see, New Hampshire Council on Developmental Disabilities. I'm a 2018 graduate of Leadership Series. And uh, let's see, I'm a volunteer at Advocate Yourself, Advocate New Hampshire, uh, Gateways Family Advocacy Network, JFAN, and I'm on the Committee for Participant Directed Managed Services, and I'm an alternate for New Hampshire Quality Council in, uh, based in Concord. Hey, and I am Susan Zimmerman, and I am a project manager at the New Hampshire Council on Developmental Disabilities. I also co-teach a um, graduate level course in leadership education and developmental disabilities at UNH. Um, I have two children, ages, um, two boys, ages 16 and 19, and my 19 year old, has Down syndrome as well as um, autism spectrum disorder. So clearly my, my older son, Oliver, is um, why I do the work that I do. And um, it's what, what I am passionate about as well. The purpose of the workshop is to understand why it is important to support people with disabilities to make their own choices to understand how your own values can either enhance or suppress the decision-making capacity of the people that you support, to provide you with tools to empower the clients you support to make their own choices and to dream big, to dream outside the box. And it also is to increase your understanding of what choice really is for people with disabilities in four different life domains, including employment, healthcare, lifelong learning, civic engagement and community living. So why is it that people with disabilities have the worst life outcomes of, uh, in every metric of, of any identified protected class in the United States? Why is it that people with disabilities have the lowest rates of high school graduation, the lowest rates of employment, the poorest health outcomes, the highest rates of violent crime and sexual exploitation, why is it that people with disabilities have the highest rates of poverty? What is the root of the problem? People with disabilities spend very little time in the middle of our communities living meaningful lives. Most students with disabilities are separated out from gener general education classrooms, despite that 30 years of research on inclusive education shows that inclusive education raises the outcomes for all students in all metrics when all students are learning together. Not a single study on segregated education demonstrates that it works better than inclusive ed. We all know the long history of institutionalization, which here in New Hampshire in 1991 ended when we closed Laconia State School. Um, and we know that students with disabilities were finally allowed in classrooms in 1975 in a law that predated the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Although at, at that point, they were in basements and at the ends of halls and in these little pods outside the buildings. So why is it that people with disabilities live so separately and under such impoverished conditions? Why aren't people with disabilities simply fully included in the American dream? 
and, and all of the other things I just discussed. I wanna offer to you that the cultural story we are told about people with disabilities wrongly teaches us as a society to think less of them. Similar to racism and sexism, ableism is at the root of the challenge. So ableism is a set of cultural stories we are fed on how to look at and think about people with disabilities. So I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more. Ableism, as I mentioned, is the sort of the ugly step sibling to racism and sexism. Ableism is about the messages we receive from people around us, most of the time accidentally. And the systems that are in place that keep people with disabilities in the category of other, those people, those students over there, they're not really like us. They are special people. We are taught to treat people with disabilities as though they're perpetual children. Maybe we're taught to have low, that they have low potential and not to have very high expectations. And just like racism and sexism, ableism begin, uh, exists on three levels. There's systemic ableism, person-mediated ableism, and internalized ableism. Let's talk about each of the ways in which these levels create barriers for people with disabilities um, from, from being even told how to strive or dream for a big life, right? So our world is sort of designed for able-bodied people. Ableism is a kind of an oppression that denies people with disabilities a feeling of belonging in the middle of the American dream. So an example of um, systemic ableism, I've already discussed one of them. Um, segregated education is a separate system of educating students from others. And while it is rooted in incredibly good intentions, it has kind of gone awry. Um, because if people with disabilities aren't in the middle of their high schools with um, peers who don't yet experience disabilities, how can we accept those same how can we expect those same peers to uh, have people with disabilities be assistant coaches, join the Rotary Club, or be hired in the small businesses that their high school um, peers uh, will own in the future if they're not actually in the same classrooms as people who don't yet experience disabilities? So um, another um, example of uh, systemic ableism would be um, when a doctor uh, gives the message to a family that discovers that their uh, pregnancy is someone with a disability and gives the strong message that this is not really a life quite worth living and that you have options to unburden yourself from living with a child with a disability. And, and um, doctors are not fortune tellers and they are not developmental pediatricians and they're not experts on um, disability. They are experts in medicine, um, but they are not perfect in their knowledge about outcomes um, and they're not, they're not God. So they don't get to decide uh, which lives are worth living. So um, an example of person mediated uh, ableism is when the coach in the little league team or on the rec soccer team says to mom or dad, your, your little one can't play on the soccer team because of their disability. You need to send them to special Olympics. We don't take kids with disabilities on the little league team or in, in recreational soccer. And then an example of, of internalized ableism is when somebody is treated as though they shouldn't dream big or that they're not quite capable of um, earning a brown belt in karate. Sometimes people internalize those kinds of messages and they believe less in themselves and they have lower self-esteem about their own expectations, about their own aspirations. So I've just gone on and on about this big concept of ableism. Again, it's very much akin to the ideas of racism, sexism, homophobia. I would love for you to reflect on where in your life you have seen ableism 
um, discrimination based on disability happen either when you were with a client or maybe you just observed it, maybe you've experienced it. Um, and so each of the levels, where, where can you identify that there's systemic discrimination against people with disabilities? Where is there, where have you seen or experienced someone being discriminatory to someone uh, on the street, in the community, at a job, in a restaurant? And then what, what would be examples of people internalizing messages that make them think less about themselves? I'm a life skills coach. When I take um, people to the doctor, sometimes the doctor turns right to me as if I were the patient. And I, it's so hard because you have to like turn your face towards the person that actually is your patient. That happens like 90% of the time. It's very difficult. Thank that you. Is, yes. That's a very common, common thing that, that happens. Mm -hmm. I think that's ableism. Yep. Well, it totally, it is precisely ableism. Absolutely. It's, it's ableism on two levels. So we have a medical school system that doesn't correct uh, doctors in training from, from thinking this way about people with disabilities. And then the doctors themselves inadvertently are being um, ableist on a, on a personal level, right? So they're, they're, per, they're perpetuating the person mediated ableism because the system didn't teach them any differently. Right. It's just, it's so awful. I hate it. It's That's, so okay. awful. That's a great example. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? I will offer up another one. How about the genetic counselor or the maternal fetal medicine doc who says to mom and dad four or five different times, you have a very short amount of time to make a decision. When are you gonna make your decision? You don't really wanna have that, you know, you don't want that burden of a child with Down syndrome or a child with a, a diagnosed prenatal disability. And, and there are, um, maternal fetal medicine docs and genetic counselors in New Hampshire who come right up pretty close to being as candid as I just was. Um, they dress it up with a little bit more medical speak than that. But it's that same feeling of, um, we now have the tools prenatally to eliminate any disabilities before birth. So why would you bother having a child with a disability? That's right, painful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where it falls, but when I go with an individual to a store, uh, one particular individual I'm thinking of has um, hear, um, communication issues, so he can hear and understand everything, but he cannot communicate Kate, clearly, mm -hmm. um, unless he wants to. <laughs> but uh, the cashier often looks at at us for that communication. But if he asks the question or says, is that all you want? The person will answer him, but he doesn't even bother. They just look and say, you know, are you all set? And I, again, I do the same thing. I just kind of put my hand toward the, uh, go ahead and ask him, you know, don't say it verbally, but I'm, I make sure he yeah. knows that I'm not the customer. Yeah, that that is definitely a form of ableism. Do you, I don't. Do you, is Lisa? Would you say that is a systemic form or more of a person mediated form? I would say that that was person to person. Um, I would say that. Do Do you think that um, they're doing it purposefully, or do you think they're doing it because they've never been uh, explained that? Um, they can talk to the person themselves. Like sometimes I think automatically they're trying to be kind. I don't think that I've worked only three years um, with, with the company I work with and I have anywhere between three and five clients and during a week. And I find that if I say something, 
um, like the prior one was just saying, you can ask him or you can ask her. I think they're surprised actually, because I think they think they're doing the right thing by talking to us. I don't That's think they're going out of their way and saying, oh, that person's you know, handicapped or disabled, so I'm not talking to them because they I, don't know. I think right, we, I, we need to give a little more education to them because um, this is all new to me. And when I grew up, like probably most of us my age, all of the um, people with other abilities were in different rooms. We never were even in the same right. room. Someone like that, right? Or you know, anybody that was uh -huh. supposedly um, had a different ability than us. So I, th I think with education or you know, S Special Olympics is helping with that. Us being out in the community all every day, all day. Us, uh, us support staffs, DSPs, or anything. Just mentioning like that prior woman just said, oh yeah, you can talk to them. I think simple little acts like that are gonna go a long way for all of all of us. Elena, I think we need to hire you to become a trainer with us. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, precisely, you know, precisely this dealing with person to person presumptions that people with disabilities are less competent or um, or not able to communicate or can't make decisions or be spoken to um, as a as a co-equal embodied adult. Totally right that like providing that feedback 100% with you. Um, and, and sometimes changing our own internal framework takes a lot of time. So uh, we just we just need to make the commitment to it. And it sounds like you're way ahead of the curve. And appreciate you offering that of course yeah of course we need to be kind and in when we see it in order to take people um through the learning journey that they need to to readjust um their vision of people with disabilities right i like to say that um we've been given the kind of um myths about people with disabilities and i call it i call it we see people with disabilities through the blinding glasses of ableism and once, once we can identify that people are even kind-heartedly discriminating, we can help people to take off those blinding glasses. And um, then to be able to see people with disabilities for the fully embodied humans that they are with rights and passions and talents and desires. And dreams, and, yes. And, yes, and dreams. <laughs> and I, and can I add to that too, Lisa? Sorry, yeah, I, I just want to say too that we all we all have our own biases too, based on you know how we, we were brought up and what experiences we've had, um, our history, you know the history that was around us, the culture that was around us as we were we we were growing up. So um, yeah, we we all we all are in that fight to combat right. ableism. Right. So one of the coolest things that happened, I have an individual that would go to Subway and the staff would, uh, would be very uncomfortable and, and look to me. And part of it was communication. She needs some guidance. But after a period of time, I can step back and there's this comfort that the employees have, especially ones that are there consistently. They know her, they know what she wants. They, they, she always introduces me every time because every day is a new day and uh and they go right along with it it's like nice to meet you again and it's wonderful to see the other side from a person who didn't have an experience of dealing with anyone with disabilities so there is a uh, there are steps to get there right and i think uh i think a big part it's such a, a fruitful discussion already um but a, a big part of, uh, of, of what's coming up for me as I'm listening is um, acknowledging when in my past I have, um, I have actually been the perpetrator of ableism mm -hmm. and, um, and being really honest about that kind of self-reflection allows me to come to a place of being able to educate from where I stand now. And that's a huge um, and very challenging part of the process for me. And, um, and I expect I'm not alone in that, but, um, 
these this conversation is very helpful to kind of begin the process of or continue the process of unpacking that um because it's painful to look at i don't want to look i don't want to look at when i've perpetrated ableism um but i know that i i know that i have in the past and um being able to let go of that and uh, and be in a place of um honesty and and educating by 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 doing right and by being in by being in the world and being an advocate and a supporter um that's what's coming up for me right now thanks thank you thanks so much yeah so to dovetail on what Elena shared, so we have to push back against ableism in our work, in our families, in our communities. And we, we have to be creative and we have to think out of the box and play our part in building a world that is universally designed for people with disabilities and people without disabilities, right? We have to believe in people with disabilities. We have to believe that they are lifelong learners that they are valuable employees, that they deserve to be civically engaged, and that they deserve the, the right to high quality healthcare where a doctor or a healthcare provider talks directly to them. We have to believe that people with disabilities have desires and thoughts, even if those of us who are temporarily abled don't yet have the tools and technologies to understand everything that's going on inside of the person with a disability. So we have to work to eliminate ableism and supporting your client to make choices to dream big is part of the path of each of us being able to play our part in tearing, off, tearing down barriers that prevent people with disabilities from having truly robust community-based lives. And you all are at the forefront of that fight um, or that struggle. And so here are some tools. So the Bureau that oversees Medicaid services for your clients is really excited about a new framework called charting the life course. Um, your client's individual service agreement may include activities or goals using this, uh, this model. Um, it contains six life domains as a way to make sure every part of a client's life mirrors life for people who don't have a disability. Um, these include daily life and employment, healthy living, social and spirituality, community living, safety and security, and citizenship, citizenship and advocacy. Um, the framework is a way of expanding activities week in and week out that achieve the good life for people with disabilities. So your client may uh, want you to be trained in this model. Kelly actually has had quite a bit of experience with this model and I'm wondering, Kelly, if you could share what that experience has been and how it's helped you. Yes, I've had experience with this framework. I took a two day course and was asked to participate on a committee to educate families and individuals about the importance of my own life course. For instance, I put together a one page document that explains what people like and admire about me and what is important for people to know about me and how people can best support me in my job as a retail associate. My hope is that this document will provide my employer with a better understanding of who I am and how to best support me. Okay, another concept that you may come across as a DSP or as a family member or, or um, an individual with a disability is a supported decision-making. Supported decision-making is a tool that allows people with disabilities to retain their decision-making capacity by choosing supporters to help them make choices. A person using this model selects trusted advisors, such as friends, family members, or professionals to serve as their supporters. These supporters then agree to help the person with a disability understand, consider, and communicate decisions, giving the person with a disability the tools to make their own informed decisions. And what's really interested, what's really interesting about supported decision making, especially in our state right now, is that um, it's being discussed that this should be an alternative to guardianship. So instead of um, a parent or an individual being a guardian of a person with a disability, the individual 
chooses a team of friends, family members, whoever they want to be on their team to help that individual, him or herself, to make their own choices. Okay, so what we're gonna focus on now is person-centered planning. It's another tool to help a person with a disability dream big, and the model is going to be the primary focus of our workshop because it's not only a helpful tool, but state law actually requires that uh, it be used as a framework for people with disabilities in our state. So it's really important that you understand it. Um, essentially what it is, it's an ongoing process, um, an ongoing problem solving process used to help people with disabilities plan for their future. Um, it involves a caring group of individuals focusing on the individual and that person's vision of what they would like to do in the future. The team meets to identify opportunities for the focused person to develop personal relationships, participate in their community, increase control over their own lives, and develop the skills and abilities needed to achieve these goals. It also depends on a committed team to take action to make sure that the strategies discussed in planning meeting, meetings are implemented. I have um, experience with that, Susan. Yeah, go I ahead, Kelly. I'd love to hear it. I had a person-centered meeting in September, and now that I've been with PDMS, Participant Direct Admitted Services, for a year, as of May 1st of 2020, I have to have a new plan. So they gave me an individual service plan rather than another person-centered plan, and they are different. Do you want to say something about the difference between those, Kelly, or do you want me to talk uh, I about think it? that one thing that's different about the person-centered plan, they focus more on the positive. In the individual service plan, they can focus more on the negative, but maybe you have some more information about that. I, I think, um, so I don't, so I think they're just philosophically different. You know, um, um, for instance, a person center plan is a much more whole systems approach um, centered around the individual and future. Uh, Marie, do you have a question? Yeah, I just had a comment on that. All of the yep. service agreements now run through the uh, HRST system, and it's mm -hmm. one it's one template for both for all um, PDMS and traditional services. Okay. Yes, so it, we, we a, understand that, but uh, an individual service agreement is not the same process or the same philosophy as a person centered plan. Right, I'm just saying the document that they would receive legally would come out looking different because it runs through the HRST system. Okay. All right, but I just, so I want to make a point though that the, the, the individual service agreement is, is not the same thing as a person-centered plan. A person-centered plan is much more, you know, it's a holistic approach to look at an individual's future and, and um, what types of goals that person has and mm -hmm. how, how a DSP can meet those goals and help that person meet those goals. Um, and it's really important to know um, as DSPs, you know, what, what your client's goals are for the future um, and how you can refine activities in his or her, or her own lives um, to meet those goals and, and to understand that those types of goals can change over time. For instance, if you had a, a client named John and if he's, um, you know, really loves artwork and he is, um, you know, he, you know that he goes to an adult day program and does some art there, but, you know, he's kind of bored with doing that couple times a week. And then you find out that he's super interested in, for instance, I don't know, like, ceramics, um, and you learn, you know, you as a DSP can research, you know, ceramic classes in the community. Um, and you can make a, you know, you could, you could help John, you know, you could think outside the box and help John um, develop some goals around the interest in ceramics by taking actual courses in the community. Um, yeah, so, um, so that's just an example of how, how you could refine an activity um, to help a, a, one of your, 
you know, when a, a person you work with um, sort of dream big and outside the box. Does the, hi, um, hi. Does the center planning, um, can it involve employment? Because I have a client that I'm working on um, that wants to do serve safe classes and certification. Absolutely. So I'm, so I'm kind of like super excited that we're, that we're going to do that because um, he's a line cook at a restaurant and he just wants to, uh, he's more employment focused, um, especially lately with Mm -hmm. what's going on um you know just trying to get the job i just wanted to uh, double check you know whether if it was just activities or whether if it could be mm -hmm. a, a it's everything both. and we like to think of those kind of those life domains that i talked about you know person-centered planning can affect can be a part of each of those should be a part of each of those life domains employment recreational activities um lifelong learning all of those things, you know, when you think of goals for your client, you should, you know, it's really good to think about all of those, those mm -hmm. aspects of an individual's life. And it's, it's helpful to frame them in terms of life domains um, right. so that you're covering everything, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have something about that. Um, my choice was denied because I was um, going shopping with my dress support professional and she wanted me to go down a certain aisle and I didn't really understand why she was choosing that when I can choose that myself and then she wanted me to not buy soda and I wanted to buy it so it's like it's my money so I chose to buy it but obviously sometimes that's not the best choice you could maybe choose something like water or something like that which is more healthy Actually, Lisa, can we, thanks for sharing that experience, Kelly. Um, that is something that I want to talk about that's really related to something we're going to, um, a, a concept that we are going to address called dignity of risk. But if we can go okay, to the sure. next slide. Um, so through person-centered planning, how does individual choice happen? We need to encourage self-advocacy, speaking up for oneself, Encourage self-determination in your clients, the right to be provided opportunities, supports, and authority to make choices and decisions about one's own life. Um, encouraging individuals to assume responsibility for their own choices, right? It also involves identifying preferences, interests, and goals. The example I gave you before of, of this individual named John, you know, his interest was in in ceramics, so what can you do to, to expand that into the larger community, that, that interest? Identifying opportunities to make meaningful choices to realize those goals. And Kelly brought up that example um, of her being in that supermarket, right? And um, her DSP said to her, well, you know, you shouldn't be drinking soda, Kelly, you know, that's, that's uh, not very good for you. But Kelly is, how old, I shouldn't ask you, Kelly's my age. <laughs> and 50 plus, let's put it that way. Right? We are both 50 plus, Kelly. But, but, you know, how did that make you feel? I didn't like it because I can choose whether to drink soda or not. And uh, she wanted me to go down a certain aisle and I didn't understand why she wanted me to do that. I should be able to say, well, this aisle looks like it might be going fast. Not too many people with right. thousands of things in their cart. I'll just go here. Yeah, so, the, so what Kelly is describing, this is a perfect example of um, explaining um, dignity of risk. Everyone has the right to take risks when engaging in life experiences and the right to fail in taking these risks. So we're gonna talk about this a little more. Um, so, so in other words, there may be potential un, un, um, unattended consequences to your client's choices and you have to be okay with that to a certain extent. Think about it, people without disabilities engage in risky behavior all the time, right? People smoke knowing the health, health consequences of smoking. People um, gamble when they don't have money. They ride their bicycles on streets knowing they could be, you know, 
get into an accident. Um, just to give you a simple example of um, my own son, Oliver is 19 years old. He likes to go outside with short sleeves on in 40 degree weather. Do I like that he does that as his mother? Of course not, you know, but he's an, he's an adult now. He's 19 years old and he should have the right to wear a short sleeve shirt if he wants to uh, when it's cold outside. Um, I mean, after all, in high school, you see kids, kids in shorts, you know, when it's freezing out. So these guys are making their own decisions. Why can't Oliver make his own decision? Um, so that's not to say, though, I, I, you know, there's a fine line. Oliver doesn't understand issues with regard to safety. So if Oliver wants to make the choice to cross a busy street when there's a lot of traffic, I am absolutely not going to let him do that. So I just want to point out that sometimes there's a very fine line between uh, safety and honoring the dignity of risk. But, you know, you, it's it, it's definitely important though to realize that that um, people with disabilities who are adults have the same um, they should be able to make decisions like everyone else in their daily life. So, how can we support individual choice for people with disabilities? Um, the uh, National DSP Association says we have to embrace a person-centered approach and support self-direction. People receiving supports need to be empowered to make their own choices, whether it involves relationships, privacy, sexuality, well-being, or other areas. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities should be supported in making informed decisions. While understanding the associated risks and responsibilities that are tied to those decisions. So even if the individual you work with doesn't have a person centered plan and they don't fully yet understand the concepts of self advocacy or self determination or choice, it is still important for DSPs to bear in mind week in and week out these concepts, right? It provides openings for you to ask the right questions and um, that, that can lead to different activities in helping that individual strive for their dream, for their dream life. Um, in your work, do you ask yourself, am I providing choice today? Did I provide choice this week? And how can I better support this person to exercise self-determination even if they don't have that word in their own lexicon yet? So, and if you don't, if you don't currently ask yourself these questions, I would say to you, if if you learn nothing else in this um, workshop today, ask yourself those questions week in and week out. Make that one of your big takeaways. Um, and this is a way to engage in um, professional self-reflection and awareness. I'd like to give you um, uh, an example of. Um, pathways to goals that, that are unconventional. Um, and when we're looking at tearing down ableist assumptions to ensure, ensure that people have their own choice, I have, I have a good story. So my son Forrest, when he was in the ninth grade, he did not understand the difference between $100 and $1,000. And at that point in my own parenting journey, I truly believed that Forrest would never be able to live independently in his own apartment if he did not learn the concept of money, right? And so we spent a lot of time his first two years in high school banging in that he needed to get this very abstract com concept called money in order for him to be able to live independently. So the barrier, the way I was taught to think about people with disabilities is if you don't understand how money works, you don't get to live by yourself. And so that's like a little, that's like a, a, a stop in the road to a, a fully embodied adult life. Well, it occurred to me sometime when he was in high school that there are tons of Americans, tens of thousands of Americans who carry enormous amounts of educational <clears throat> debt and other sorts of credit card debt. And while those of us who 
are temporarily able to think we know something about money. The actual facts and statistics for Americans is that we carry a whole bunch of a debt that makes it makes it clear that we don't really quite understand the concept of money as, as much as we'd like to think that we do. So along the way, you know, you learn about ATMs and there's all sorts of alternatives to folks understanding the, the, the abstractness of money um, and to be able to support people with disabilities to live on their own. And let me tell you, my son, um, when he was 20 years old, he began living in his own apartment um, because we, I took off that, I took down the barrier um, and the assumption that if he didn't understand money, he couldn't live on his own. And we just got creative and kind of worked around that. And we have other, um, other ways to make sure that Forrest is learning to be fiscally responsible and to stay within his budget. Um, but it doesn't involve him understanding the difference between $100 and $1,000 because he still just doesn't get that. So the question to, um, to ask ourselves is, not whether or not somebody can or can't do something. Um, it's how do we get to yes? And you know that you're fighting ableist assumptions if you are thinking about how do we get to yes rather than presuming that um, each scenario in front of a person with a disability is a yes, no. Here is a list of some of the things to think about when you are um, developing a person-centered plan and, and what, um, um, what, it should, what, what this plan should take into account. Um, it should take into account your client's preferences, um, what are their strengths and values, their, their developmental needs, their talents, their interests, what hobbies and activities do they engage in that really energize them and um, that they're passionate about? What are their talents? What are their natural gifts and abilities? Um, do they like music or writing or reading? What are their core beliefs and values? What are their environmental preferences? In other words, you know, where does this person feel comfortable and motivated? And what are their dreams and goals? Um, these can be reflected in activities such as employment, where a person lives and with whom, and their relationships. <clears throat> Kelly, I know you're trying to speak. Can you put unmute? I'm oh, sorry. That's okay. Actually, my interests have changed. When, when I was like in my 20s and 30s, I wasn't interested in advocacy, but now I am because I went to leadership and I went to conferences and People, staff noticed that I was interested in it. So if I was, if they didn't notice, I wouldn't be where I am today. So I think it's good that they should notice things that you are changing. Like you maybe like music or you like a certain kind of music and then maybe you decide you don't like that kind of music anymore. Things like that. So all of these things, preferences, interests, talents, all these things listed here um, can change. You know, they're not stagnant things. Um, you know, people's dreams change over time, um, their goals, their talents, you know, all of these things. So, so that's a really important point, Kelly. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, I want to take a, a, a minute here and do a little exercise. I want us to think about um, the sort of the stereotypical person with a disability in New Hampshire. I'm, I'm trying to get at a stereotype here, okay, in some of those domains that we talked about. So let's, for instance, take employment. Um, if you were to think about a person with a disability in New Hampshire, the stereotype, what kind of job does that person engage in? Yes, Chris. You're muted. There we go. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to unmute. That's I had okay. To find the button. Um, I see a lot with. With the clients, at least that I've worked with in the past, it's been a lot of janitorial, like janitorial, work. yep. Okay, um, cleaning, gotcha. cleaning, light duty cleaning. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Denise, yeah, food service. People can just popcorn their answers. You don't have to be called on. Yeah. Oh, file clerk, file clerk. Shout it out, or you could also, uh, Isadora said, 
just put your answers in um, in the chat if you'd like yeah. to as well. Stocking in a grocery store, file clerk. Mm -hmm. Laundry service or hospitality is in the mm -hmm. chat. Yep. Collector. Yep, these are all very stereotypical roles for a person with a disability in, in mm -hmm. the state of New Hampshire. And in terms of how many hours or, you know, times a week this person works, what would you say, stereotypically? 20 hours? I don't, I'm not sure that that's the average. No, that yeah. there's. I think it's a bit less than that. Yeah, March, one or two hours. Yeah. One or yeah. two hours. I think that's yeah. more like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. five at that most. Volunteering is also. Um, yeah, two, two hours to meet the criteria for quote unquote employment. Okay. And right yeah. now we're just trying to to discuss what the average oh, okay. stereotype is around the life of a person with a disability. Right. Okay. So it, we're getting at the stereotype here. So, so if, for instance, if, um, yeah, if you knew nothing about what a person with a disability is capable of, um, you know, if you were to ask somebody, anybody on the street, you know, what would you think? How many hours would a person with a dis, you know, what about in others? domains of life what about it in terms of recreational activities what what would you consider to be a stereotype stereotypical activities for people with disabilities in terms of recreation unified sports unified sports thanks marge so a segregated type of sporting event Walking the aisles of Walmart, Special do you Olympics. Often, yeah, do you often think of people bowling in the town rec league with all of the other um, town rec league bowling? Or do you think of people as bowling within the Special Olympics bowling team? What's people's experience? Segregated. 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 In groups with other people with ID, DD, yeah. And, and with with the uh, the bumpers on the alley. Yeah, that, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, and what about lifelong learning? What, what kinds of uh, do people with disabilities stereotypically engage in lifelong learning? Are they seen as lifelong learners? Okay. What domain am I missing here? Civic and um, healthcare. Social. Social recreation. Mm, personal social relationships. Oh yes, thank you. Social personal relationships. And healthcare. Mm -hmm. I, there were a lot of things going through chat. Do we want to cooking class? Thanks for all the, this input. Yep, cooking class. So sh okay. Someone will attend a class at a day program. That's mm -hmm. day programs, cooking classes, line line dancing. I. Um, I just want to, Marie said in chat that, that the assumption is that people with disabilities should not, um, should not get married or be in intimate relationships. Right. I think I'd like to say something about healthcare. Go ahead, Kelly. I think that the stereotypical view is that they go to the doctor with their DSP or someone supporting them. Mm -hmm. They probably don't think that, oh, uh, they could go to the doctor independently or the dentist or any kind of healthcare appointment, things like that. They just probably go, no, they can't do that. They need the DSP to speak for them instead of them speaking for themselves. That's the stereotypical, I think. 
Yeah, Talk and that example them. that example that had come up earlier when we were talking about ableism too is that the the physician generally or the provider tends to speak to the DSP and not to the not to the individual. And so um, there's an assumption out there that um, people with disabilities cannot make their own health care decisions. Or even speak for themselves. Or um, even speak for themselves. Right. Yeah, thank you. It's up to us to avert our, uh, avert our attention so that there's no question that he must speak to the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Marge, yeah. All right, these are great. So I did, I just wanted us to think about these stereotypes um, and, and really kind of emphasize the, the fact that people with disabilities have desires, ideas, talents. Maybe we can go back to that slide for a little bit, Lisa, and look at all those, those bulleted um, items. People with disabilities have all of these things, preferences, interests, talents, values. They have dreams and goals just like anybody else, just like people without disabilities. Um, and I want us to think about what, how would you feel, right? What would your life be like if nobody believed that you had any of these? Well, and, and what would your life be like if, if this were your life, and this was the life that people believed in you, that, that you deserved. Mm -hmm. It's heartbreaking. Right? There's, so, there's quite a contrast there, isn't there? When you think about what you want to do with your own life and what you see on that whiteboard. So I just want to, I just want us to think about that for a little bit and reflect on that. We just talked about what the life of a person with a disability includes. What, let's spend a couple of minutes thinking about what your life includes. What is your community like? Are you a member of a political um, party? Do you belong to um, a bike walk alliance or to um, a karaoke? Do you regularly go to karaoke when it's not COVID? Maybe you quilt. Are you a Rotarian? Do you um, have, um, what are some of your interests and hobbies? Maybe you're in a singing group. Maybe you attend church every week. Um, or go to the gym. Or go to the gym. What are some of the things you do? What is in your community? Go ahead, popcorn out. What do you all like to do? What do you do? I like to hike. I like to go to concerts. Like concerts and riding a motorcycle. No, March. <laughs> <laughs> Is anyone the par a part of an acapella or a choir or belong to community theater? Has anyone been on a tech crew? or been, a, been a, a, a big brother or a big sister. So um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the contrast about the stereotypical life for a person in New Hampshire with a disability and contrast it to sort of the collective life that um, life activities that those of us who are here um, in this workshop those of us who support people with disabilities and what that, that contrast is. And we just, we wanna ask you, why should the life of the person you support be different than a life that any of us would want to lead? And so what, what we just wanna remind you is that ableism and the messages around what kind of expectations we should have for the life of a person with a disability, those are the messages that prevent us from supporting the ability to dream big and to think creatively outside of the box about employment opportunities, recreational opportunities, civic engagement, how to um, assert dignity in the healthcare setting, um, and how to think about lifelong learning. So I would say that, um, we have to constantly be supporting people to be dreaming big 
about living in the middle of the community that you and I have easy access to. We want to support people to have as easy access to the middle of the community um, that, that we are so privileged to have. So um, we have a video to share with you. Supporting individual choice and a robust community-based life. Messages for direct support professionals. This video was created as part of an interactive training for direct support professionals entitled Dream Big, Tools for Supporting Individual Choice and a Robust Community-Based Life. The training is available at no charge for provider agencies as part of the Living Well NH Quality Frameworks Grant. For details and to schedule training, please contact the NH Council on Developmental Disabilities at info at nhcdd.us. I would like my DSP to help me develop my public speaking skills so that I could testify at state hearings to support people with disabilities. I want my DSP to take terrific notes in my college classes so that I can focus on the lecture. I want my DSP to not feel uncomfortable when she sees me holding my girlfriend's hand. I want my DSP to help me start a rock band. I want my DSP to help support me with my dating app so I can find a girlfriend. I want my DSP to take me apartment hunting. I want my DSP to provide some on-the-job support so I can work and explore new opportunities in the grocery and retail industries. In embracing a person-centered approach and supporting self-direction, people receiving supports need to be empowered to make their own choices whether it involves relationships, privacy, sexuality, well-being, or other areas, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities should be supported in making informed decisions while understanding the associated risks and responsibilities that are tied to those decisions. National Association of Direct Support Professionals. Special thanks to the participants in order of appearance. Devin, Forrest, Alex, Oliver, Samuel, Kelly, Chloe. Presented by New Hampshire Council on Developmental Disabilities, ABLE NH, and People First of NH. The content of this training was developed by the NH Council on Developmental Disabilities in partnership with the Living Well New Hampshire Quality Frameworks Grant funded from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Administration for Community Living, Administration on Disabilities, Developmental Disabilities Projects of National Significance. The contents do not necessarily represent the policy of the Department of Health and Human Services Administration for Community Living Department, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal government. Any reactions to the, to the, to the video? We always say, listen to what our individuals want, and right there it was said, <clears throat> It, it was interesting how varied their desires were. Everything from work to a girlfriend to eating, it just was very interesting. What was interesting about it to you? Um, well, I, I work with pretty high functioning people and um, like if they wanna do something, they just, they just tell me, like they don't wait for an opportunity. They just mm -hmm. say, hey, Lauren, you know, next week I want to learn how to or do or go to or have this person come with us. Like, I, I, yeah, I, I liked how they were strung all together and they wanted all different things, but the basic thing was they want some independence and they want more independence, not some, they want more independence and more, like they're, they're very clear in what they want. Like there's no like, um, next week I'd like to, I don't know. There's, there was none of that. I like that yeah. a lot. They, they want to be supported to um, yeah. fulfilling their dream. Exactly. So I have, 
I have but a, the articulation was so clear. I love that. I have um, a story about high functioning and low functioning. Okay. And those terms. Uh oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, don't be sorry. It's it's uh, it's all of us just in a conversation, and sometimes when we're trying to unpack. Um, Sometimes, sometimes there's our little tension points. And um, so my son Forrest uh, was going, when he was going into the ninth grade, um, we, we were, we were, I was taking a tour of the school building and I bumped into a guidance counselor and um, my son went to a little tiny, little tiny country school until the eighth grade. So he was fully included by, by the fact that it was a private school and it was really tiny. So we didn't have to worry about fighting for him to be included in general education classrooms up until the eighth grade, because he was there was only one classroom. Um, so, um, so I was taking a tour of his public high school, and I bumped into a, a guidance counselor. And this is this is a pretty rugged story. So put your seatbelts on, everybody, because it's a rough ride. And. I had not really experienced because I live in a small town and I had sort of shielded our family from a lot of ableist stuff, not not exclusively, but I had not seen any overt systemic discrimination. So I, I, I tell this guidance counselor, my son Forrest speaks a little French, he speaks some German, he's doing math at the fifth grade level. And I was really excited because I had just enrolled him in all general education classes. And the guidance counselor looked at me and said, oh, you must be really proud. You got a high functioning Downs kid. <gasps> oh, wow. And um, he's like, that's such a relief for you. And I, I, was, I was so taken aback. I'll leave out the expletives that I inserted into my response to him. But what I, but what I said to him is, well, I'm not really sure what you're talking about in terms of high functioning or low functioning, but I'd like to understand why you're a low functioning middle manager in a podunk school district. What's your genetic excuse? Nice. Right? And so we don't think of our dentists as high functioning or low functioning. I don't think of my sister, well, sometimes I do, but... Um, <laughs> But we don't think about our friends or our colleagues as as high functioning or low functioning. So I would I would offer up to you to consider the idea that these categories of high functioning and low functioning are part of that ableist discriminatory myth uh, storytelling that helps to keep people with disabilities hierarchically arranged. So if you're high functioning, you're, you're more worthwhile than someone low functioning. And we sort of have to, we have to eliminate all of those categories and labels so that we can get to the heart of who a person really is, even if we don't have a Rosetta Stone that perfectly interprets everything that's going on inside of their hearts and minds. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I was using it as they all live alone they, and they all have jobs. I, it wasn't so much function as where they are. But I'll use another term next time. No, I, it's just it's just a conversation point. And it's one of those subtle it's one of those subtle ways in which um, it, it's uh, that we're still working on mm -hmm. making sure that we don't apply ways to describe people with disabilities that we wouldn't describe for our dentists, our husbands, our wives, or um, colleagues. Just, just something to think about. I understand. I'm going to try to think of how I could, how I could have said that differently, but, but given the impression that they are like, they're solid, solidly independent. There you go. It's right there. So we are going to go into breakout rooms again in a moment, and I'd like to introduce you to your new client. Her name is Josephine, and um, she is a 24-year-old individual with a developmental disability who uses a communication device, not words, to communicate. In high school, she contributed to the high school newspaper and was on the anti-bullying committee. Josephine dreams of having a job and living away from her parents. 
She loves all types of music, basketball, reading, and enjoys many types of physical activities, except biking. She is very interested in dating men. She prefers lakes over the ocean. She does not like loud noises or sitting for long periods of time or cartoons. Her mom is a respiratory therapist. Her dad works for the DOT. Her older brother manages a local restaurant. Currently, Josephine is unemployed, occasionally attends her local church, and volunteers at the animal shelter once a week for two hours. She attends Special Olympics. Currently, she's kind of living the stereotypical life of a young woman with a disability in New Hampshire. You have the lucky good fortune of just having become her DSP right on the heels of this workshop. You will, what will you do in the next 24 months to support Josephine's goals for living her dream life robustly in the middle of her community? If you would, please take a screenshot of this description of Josephine so that in your breakout rooms, you will still be able to um, reference back to her current high level preferences and her description. We're gonna go into breakout rooms, um, try to find someone to be a note taker um, and uh, someone who will report out. In about 10 minutes, we will come back where you can share all of the activities, um, learning and, in, um, and employment opportunities that um, you've supported Josephine to engage in for the next 24 months. And we'd like to meet your version of Josephine 24 months from now. Well, why doesn't, why doesn't your breakout room begin on the report out of what Josephine's life looks like 24 months later? Chris has got this. The first thing that we would want to do is get her feedback, get, you know, get an understanding of how she wants to live. Um, we are looking at uh, the risk for her to live alone potentially, um, and how do we manage that risk? Um, but we we talked about maybe even getting her a support living with her, um, yeah, you know, or a care person that could help with that. Um, in terms of employment, um, she loves reading, so we talked about internship at a local paper, maybe doing some editing. Um, or doing some uh, something of that sort. Um, there's mm -hmm. also folk rehab. We could join. We could get her into to help pl place her with something like that. Um, we discussed working on education, further education. You know, to help her. You know, maybe if she needs to work on some skills needed for that. Uh, we talked about advocacy groups that she could work for, anti-bullying groups, um, because she's. We have her past um, as being very big into anti-bullying with her in, within her school. Um, there was the animal shelter where we, uh, at, you know, working there, she could turn that maybe into like a dog walking business, where she could go, you know, around, you know, around town. Mm -hmm. um, that there, there's the restaurant that her brother manages. Maybe she could work on you know, getting into something there or a similar position, cooking, doing prep work, even doing, being, becoming a hostess. Uh, we discussed her, the, the, some of the difficulties that could arise with her communication device, but we also decided, decided that that could be a potential benefit for her um, to be able to, you know, and it'd be good for everyone to be able to normalize that. Um, because like the stereotype for working in a kitchen would be cleaning, dishes, that kind of stuff. Um, as far as recreational activities uh, go, we were talking about reading groups, basketball leagues, concerts, um, doing stuff that she enjoys, you know. And as far as dating and social, uh, we talked about utilizing like dance, public dances, um, and utilizing like online tools to meet people, you know, for not just for dating, but for social activities, because that's where a lot of that starts is getting to know someone socially. And that's what I've got. Thank you. How about the group Vanessa was in? Who was your, who's your report out person? I was taking notes, so okay. I will report out. Um, 
So Carmen and Janelli were in my group. And um, one of the things that they talked about um, for employment was that they would find out, you know, they would talk to her and have a conversation and learn what her dream job might be. Um, and they also developed a concept of creating a uh, vocational exploration workshop where they would go and explore different vocations and see if she liked them and what it would take um, for her to be a part of that. Um, one of the ideas was to, because um, she likes to read, would be to bring her to the library where she could read um, about different um, jobs, but also get an opportunity to see what it would be like to even work in the library. Um, as far as living independently, um, they focused on being sure that she develops and refreshes her skills um, in like surrounding managing her bills, um, cooking, um, and if she doesn't have those skills, then finding opportunities for her to develop them through some kind of like mentorship programs or other programs that she could be involved in. Um, as far as dating goes, we uh, talked about the importance of sex education um, in order to give her the confidence that she needs um, and to give her the information she needs for her to have healthy relationships. Um, also developing her conversation skills and um, working on um, doing like a makeover slash self-care so that she can gain a little bit of um, self-confidence um, just because they talk, you know, they want her to go out there and be completely confident in what she's doing and not, you know, feel like she can just pick and choose whichever, whichever one she wants, right? like we all want to. So um, also they talked about um, being sure that when they're working with her for to, you know, towards these goals, that it's important to um, treat her like an adult with respect and to make sure that what her wishes are, are what you're working towards and to not throw up obstacles um, for anything that she might want to pursue. Um, and also just regularly um, refreshing any of her skills and revisiting things just so that she can gain um, skills within um, the other skills that she's learned. So that's how far we got. We didn't get to like the actual vision, um, but we had really great conversation about it. So we, we kind of got carried away. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Talking about sex ed, we got carried right. away. Yeah. Um, has has any of the groups um, had their person sign up for Bumble or eHarmony? We just talked about dating apps in general. We we didn't specify one of no, them. No, no. Yeah, we didn't specify Lisa, but we talked about it. Alrighty. Josephine, 22 months later, she capably uses a communication device to express herself and a computer to write a weekly column for the ledger transcript on accessible recreational activities in Southwestern New Hampshire. Her DSP drives her to explore the area. She is finishing her fourth class at Nashua Community College, pursuing an associate's degree in liberal arts with a focus on creative writing. Josephine's DSP takes notes and drives. After four months of interning at her brother's restaurant, she hostesses three shifts a week. And it took four months of interning for staff, customers, and Josephine to all sync up around how to best utilize that communication device. After work, she enjoys the free drink provided to staff at the bar, and her staff took over the natural support of driving her home. Josephine joined a local bowling league. She wears earmuffs for the noise. She volunteers at the seniors community lunch every week. And six months ago, she moved into a two bedroom apartment with a roommate uh, that fit within her SSI budget. Prior to that, um, her DSP and family provided increased household chores and devised meal strategies. Um, Josephine's DSP provides 15 hours of support with chores and meal prep. In closing, we'd like to share with you in this last minute or two, 
that it is so important for DSPs to professionally challenge ourselves about what ableism has taught all of us to believe about what life with a disability is and isn't. Whether we are a parent, a friend, paid staff, we must constantly be asking ourselves, am I providing choice? How can I better support this person to exercise self-determination? And how do I support choice for this person in a world that sets up barriers to the choice, right? The heart of person-centered planning focuses on providing meaningful life choices so that the lives of people with disabilities look the same as the lives of people who are not yet impacted by disability. DSPs, thank you for your work. You are a critical bridge for people with disabilities to experience belonging and inclusion in our communities across the Granite State. Thank you.